Well, good morning. If you're watching this on Sunday morning, I'm uh, actually teaching on Friday night. And so um, take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Um, we heard some good news today from our president that uh, he said that the church houses should open up uh, as soon as they uh, would like. And so I know there's still a few uh, hurdles to clear, but uh, it sounds like we're getting really, really close to being able to be back together. And uh, I know everyone is so ready uh, to get back to normal, hopefully, and not the new normal, but the old normal. But um, I know this week I was able to get a haircut and uh, it feels so good. And so the little things that we take for granted in life uh, are so big, but uh, John chapter 3, our lesson is entitled, Jesus Teaches About the New Birth. Jesus Teaches About the New Birth. And our three points will be that new birth is a work of the Holy Spirit. New birth comes through faith in the Son of God. So new birth is a work of the Holy Spirit. New birth comes from faith in the Son of God. And new birth is a gift from God the Father. Whenever we uh, think about John chapter 3, uh, some things go th uh, running through my mind. I, I can remember as a kid watching football games or basketball games, and it seemed like uh, at every sporting event there was someone holding up a sign that said John 3.16. And so when I think of John chapter 3, I think of John 3.16, I think of that sign. Uh, John 3.16 was probably the first verse in God's word that I memorized. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Perhaps that was the first verse that you had ever memorized as well. And then one other thought that comes to my mind when I think of John chapter 3 is Billy Graham, whenever he would preach, he always said, you must be born again. Um, and of course, he was quoting Jesus and Jesus's words, but I can he still hear Billy Graham saying, you must be born again. And so uh, John chapter 3, what a chapter uh, a lot of wonderful truths packed into these uh, few verses. And so uh, I just pray that the Lord will take uh, our time together tonight or this morning and uh, and bless it. So John chapter 3, uh, not in our lesson, but I want us to read verses 1 and 2. It says, There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus. What do we know about Nicodemus? Um he was a ruler of the Jews, and he's a Pharisee. This man came to him, that is Jesus, at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one could perform these signs that you do unless God were with him. So Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Um, he is a ruler of the Jews. The commentary that uh, I'm reading, the Christ-centered exposition of the book of John, says that Nicodemus was a very serious religious man. Uh, the Pharisees, and, and especially uh, if he was a ruler of the Jews, this would be like the Green Berets of... Um, of religion back in that day. Uh, he is serious about religion. The Pharisees um, taught that there were over 613 or 613 commandments from the Old Testament, 248 do's and 365 don'ts. And so a total of uh, 613 commandments the Pharisees, uh, about 6,000 of them, committed to obeying every single command. That's how serious they were. 
they had to know the commands, and then they chose to obey the commands. And so uh, they were a strict religious group. Um, because they had to know the law in order to obey it, uh, they were experts in uh, Judaism. And, uh, and, and Nicodemus was uh, part of the Sanhedrin. And um, just ultimately serious religious guys. They knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards, could teach it. They were the judges. Uh, this commentary said it would be like putting the uh, U.S. Senate and the U.S. Supreme Court together. Uh, about 70 men made up the Sanhedrin, and they were experts in the law, and they therefore could judge the nation of Israel. And, uh, and he was morally upright in every way. And so uh, this is the Nicodemus that comes to Jesus at night. Now, uh, why did he come at night? Some say that uh, uh, he was um, trying not to be seen. Uh, there was something about Jesus that caught his attention that, uh, that maybe drew him in. And, uh, and I thought about that. You know, the Bible in Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, uh, verse 10 and 11, it says, There's no one who's righteous, no, not one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks after God. All have turned away, and all have become useless. There's no one who does what is good, not even one. And uh, the key verse that I'm trying to point out there is that there's no one who seeks God. No one in his natural state seeks after God. We're going to see that even at the end of our lesson today, or it may be uh, some of the verses right after our lesson that aren't included in our lesson. But in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, let's go ahead and read them now. It says, this then is the judgment. Jesus is speaking. He says, light has come into the world, but people loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. And so Jesus is even teaching that in our natural state, men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because the light exposes who we are. And uh, just like Adam and Eve, when they sinned and were disobedient to God, what did they try to do? They tried to cover themselves with their own uh, coverings that they had made out of fig leaves. Why? Because they realized their nakedness and their guilt and their shame. And we're just like them. Uh, we're sinful. And we sin, and uh, in our sin, we uh, are guilty, and we have shame. And, uh, and, and in that guilt and shame, we would rather hide in the darkness than be exposed by the light. And so uh, the Bible teaches that there's no one who seeks after God. And yet, what do we find Nicodemus doing here? He's coming to Jesus, and he's coming at night. And he's coming with questions. And, uh, and it, it appears that Nicodemus is seeking after Jesus. And, um, and, and so can a person seek after God? Well, the answer is both yes and no. Not in his original state. In your state of fallenness, you yourself are not going to seek after God. But... If God is drawing you by his spirit, and if you've heard the word of God, see the Bible teaches in Romans chapter 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the word of God comes first and then comes faith. And, uh, and in John chapter six, just a couple of verses, uh, chapters over from where we are uh, today, in verse 44, Jesus will say, um, 
No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one can come to Christ, Jesus says, unless the Father uh, is drawing him. And then in verse 65, it says, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. And so when the Father uh, allows the Spirit to draw a person to Jesus, then it can appear like they're seeking Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's what we have to deduct here in uh, John chapter 3, because it does appear that Nicodemus is seeking uh, the truth. It does appear that he's seeking uh, from Jesus Christ. But I would just say it has to be that behind the scenes, spiritually, we can't really see it, but God must be drawing him to Jesus Christ. Uh, the Holy Spirit must be drawing him. And uh, perhaps Nicodemus, and not really perhaps, Nicodemus has been hearing the things that Jesus is saying, and uh, and God is drawing him to Himself, and so um, Jesus uh, says in verse three, "I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God." Now, this is the first time that Nicodemus has ever heard this idea of being born again. And he is confused by it, and so would we have been if we had been, uh, uh, if that had been the first time we had ever heard this phrase, being born again. We're, we're 2,000 years removed, and so many Bible teachers and preachers have taught this before. We've heard uh, this idea of being born again, but Nicodemus had never heard it before. And Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. I uh, was thinking about my days in seminary. Uh, there was a, a class that I think I really wanted to take, and I found out that, no, you had to take this other class before you could take this class. It was called a prerequisite. You couldn't take this class until you took this class. And so I had to go and take that class in order to take that class. And uh, that's what you call a prerequisite. And that's what Jesus is saying. The prerequisite for seeing the kingdom of God is that you must be born again. So what does it mean to be born again? That's what Nicodemus says. He says, uh, how can anyone be born when he's old? How can, how can one go back into his mother's womb and come out again once you're old? I've never heard of that. Uh, never seen anybody do that. Uh, and so what are you talking about, Jesus, rabbi, teacher? Um, this does not make any sense to me, is what Nicodemus uh, was saying. So Jesus is going to explain to him what he means by being uh, born again. So Nicodemus says, can he enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born and Jesus answers him and says, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so Jesus introduces this idea to Nicodemus and to us as readers of John, uh, John's book. He introduces this idea that there is a physical realm and there is a spiritual realm. There, is, there are things that take place uh, physically in life and there are things that take place spiritually um, in eternal life. And, uh, and even here on earth, there are uh, things that happen spiritually. And so he's introducing this idea that there's a physical realm and there's a spiritual realm. Now, he says anyone, uh, someone that is born of water and the Spirit. Born of water, uh, we find in the very next verse, uh, verse 6, whatever is born of flesh is flesh. And so in verse 5, where he says whatever is born of water, I believe you have to take verse 5 and verse 6 and put them together. Born of water, 
born of flesh. He's talking about a physical birth. He's talking about the physical birth of a baby. Uh, you and I have been born physically, and that's why we're alive on earth. Uh, we're living a physical life, but Jesus is saying to Nicodemus that there's more. There is also a spiritual life, not just a physical life, but there's a spiritual life. And so you must be born physically, obviously, or else you wouldn't even be in the conversation. But you also have to be born again, or you have to be spiritually uh, reborn or made new, um, born again, born by the Spirit. And so he says in verse 5, born of water, verse 6, born of the flesh. And then he says in verse 5, and of the Spirit. And in verse 6, it says, and uh, born of the Spirit is spirit. And so there's the physical and there's the spiritual. Um, in this commentary, I loved what uh, he wrote, whoever, uh, Matt Carter and Josh Redberg. Let me give credit to where credit is due. It says, uh, if being born again isn't a physical birth, then what is it? Jesus says it's a spiritual birth. The Spirit of God makes a person alive and new from the inside. The new birth happens when God's Spirit animates the human spirit, making a person alive to the things of God. It's a total transformation of a person from the inside out. See, Nicodemus was all concerned about the outside, the outer man, but remember, man looks at the things on the outside, but what does God look at? He looks at the heart. And so it's the total, what is spiritual rebirth? It's the total transformation of a person from the inside out. Nicodemus and the Pharisees had studied the Old Testament, but they missed what God said. God said following external laws would never be enough for a person to enter his kingdom. What a person needed was an internal transformation. And so God made this promise in the Old Testament. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 through 27, he says, I will also sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and all your idols. He's, he's talking to the uh, Israelites, his people, the Jews. God is. And he says, I will give you a new heart and will put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. Notice that last phrase in Ezekiel 36 verse 27. God says, I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. See, the Jewish religious group, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, uh, the Jewish rulers, they're all trying to follow God on their own, in their own strength, and by their own will power and uh, traditions, and commitment. Um, but God says, I will put my spirit within you, and my spirit will cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. And that's the difference between just being religious and being saved and having the spirit of God living in you causing you to uh, do what is right and holy and godly in God's eyes. Uh, we don't do in order to uh, receive God's uh, blessings and his salvation. We can't earn his salvation. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, I believe, uh, Jesus will say, unless your righteousness exceeds the, the Pharisees and the scribes, which that would have been so radical for those that heard that because they would say there's no way we could exceed the, the righteousness of, of the Pharisees. 
And Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds them, uh, which it wouldn't, and, uh, and even the Pharisees, it's not enough, because Jesus will say in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, I believe, but be ye perfect, even as my Father in heaven is perfect. And you and I and the Pharisees and Billy Graham and the Apostle Paul and uh, John the Baptist, all of us have uh, fallen short of the holiness of God, the perfection that is necessary for us to be made right with God on our own. That's why we need Jesus, and that's why we needed what Jesus did for us on the cross, and that's what Jesus is uh, going to tell uh, Nicodemus in our lesson today, is that uh, your righteousness uh, can't uh, give you what you're seeking. Um, you have to be born of the Spirit. You have to be born again. So uh, the commentary, just a little bit more, it says, in spite of all of his learning, Nicodemus had missed it. He was focused on cleaning the outside and keeping external laws, but he missed what God said. In essence, God said, you need to be clean on the inside. You need to be washed with water. You need your heart to come alive by my spirit. Then and only then will you be able to obey me. And so Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. And so in verse 7, he says, don't be amazed that I told you you must be born again. Um, he says, the wind blows where it pleases, and you hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And so he compares, Jesus compares the work of the Holy Spirit to wind. Now, you know, tonight, um, I was outside just a little bit earlier, and I could feel the wind blowing. Um, I couldn't see the wind, but I could feel the wind. I could hear it. Uh, and if you watch the trees, you could see the the uh, leaves and the, the branches moving just a little bit because of the wind. And so um, we don't see the wind, uh, but we can see the evidence of the wind. We can hear the wind. Um and we can tell that the wind is blowing, and he's comparing the wind uh, to the Holy Spirit and the work of the Spirit. And he says, you don't know where it's going or where it comes from, but so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. That makes me think of uh, uh, Henry Blackaby's teaching in Experiencing God, that, uh, that you need to watch and see where God is working and wherever God is working, join him in that work. And so uh, we, we don't always know what the Spirit of God is up to, but if we watch with spiritual eyes, we can see where God is at work. And Henry Blackaby was so wise to encourage us to uh, join God in wherever he is at work. Now, Nicodemus says, how can these things be? He he still doesn't get it. Um, he, he doesn't understand all that Jesus is saying. But what does Jesus say? He says, are you a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Jesus said, I assure you, we speak of what we know and we testify for what we've seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about things that happen on earth and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about things in heaven? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who has descended from heaven, that is, the Son of Man. And then he says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. And so our first point was that uh, new birth or spiritual rebirth or being born again is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's something that the Spirit is involved in, uh, the work of regeneration. In fact, in your Sunday school lesson, uh, let me give you the blanks real quick. It says regeneration. Uh, this is on your page 115. 
is the miraculous transformation or the new birth that takes place within an individual through the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. It's the divine side of conversion. There's the divine side of conversion and there's the human side of conversion. It's like two sides of a coin. And this is what God does. He initiates the work of salvation by the Spirit of God uh, and it's a miracle of transformation. And so it's the divine side of conversion being the work of God within a person's life that causes him or her to be born again, a work that human effort is unable to produce. In other words, we cannot save ourselves apart from God's initiative or initiating, um, we could not be saved. But because God is working by his spirit and his spirit is blowing all over this world uh, and, and we don't know where the spirit is blowing, uh, but but we can see the evidence of the Spirit. He is working, drawing people to himself, um, to salvation. And it's the, the, uh, the work of regeneration or the work of the new birth. And then, uh, so that's the divine side of conversion. But then we come to uh, how the new birth comes through faith in the Son of God. And so uh, God begins the work with the Spirit, but then you must place your faith in the Son of God. And that's what Jesus is saying uh, to Nicodemus. He says, are you a teacher and you don't understand these things? He says, I've been sharing uh, things, earthly things with you, and you don't believe. How will you believe if I share heavenly things with you? And he says that uh, he is the one who... Um, has come from heaven to earth uh, to share this glorious truth. Well, in verse 14 and 15, Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have everlasting life or eternal life. I love this. So, one of my favorite stories in the Bible now is, I believe it's in Numbers chapter 21. If if I'm off a chapter, I don't mean to be. But um, it's the story where uh, the people of Israel are in the wilderness and, uh, and they're complaining to Moses about the food and, and, uh, and that, you know, did, did God and did Moses just bring them out into the desert so that they could die? Now, now keep in mind that God had already rescued these people from the hands of the Egyptians. Uh, they had been in bondage for 400 years, slavery and misery. And now he has rescued them. And not only rescued them, but I mean miraculously rescued them through the parting of the Red Sea. And then when the Egyptians came after them, uh, God closed the wall of the waters so that it, they all drowned and died. And so he took care of their enemies for them. And uh, he had miraculously provided. He's 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 um, uh, leading them to the promised land, and here they are in the wilderness, and they're complaining about the food, and they they actually they they go overboard. They they say we detest this wretched food, and and what they're doing is they're complaining about the grace and the mercy of God, and God has just had it. And so what does God do? He sends poisonous snakes into the camps, into the camp of the Israelites to his own people. And the snakes bite, the, uh, the poisonous snakes bite the Israelites so that many of the Israelites die. And so, man, it has really gotten the attention of all the people. In fact, so much so that they go to Moses, their leader, and they apologize and they say, please, Moses, beg uh, for us and, and plead on our behalf to God that he might forgive us uh, for we have sinned and we have, uh, you know, rebelled against you. And so Moses does and he goes to God and, and he pleads on behalf of the Israelite people. And, and something interesting happens. God tells Moses 
Okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to fashion a bronze snake, and I want you to mount it on a pole. Now, a snake, what had they just been bitten by? They had just been bitten by a snake. And God says, I want you to fashion a bronze snake, and I want you to mount it on a pole. What does it mean to mount, to lift up, to, to uh, nail it to a pole? And, uh, and then I want you to have everyone who has been bitten by a snake to look at that snake, that bronze snake mounted on a pole and not just look at it, not just glance at it, but they have to gaze at that snake. And if they will do that, they'll be healed. That was the, that was the way that God had chosen and so uh, for their for their healing. And so what it amounted to was they had to look at the snake. Why a snake? Because that is what had bit them. Why did the snake bite them? Because of their ungratefulness and their, uh, man, I don't even know what words to use. Their selfishness is too light. Um their whininess, I can't even think of the right words here, but uh, just pitiful, um, babyish um, display that they had and, and their ungratefulness to God, that's why they were bitten by the snake or the snakes. And so God wanted them to look at that snake mounted on a pole uh, so, number one, that they would see the reason that they had been bitten. <clears throat> and then it was in the gazing of the snake on the pole. Yes, that didn't make sense, but that was what God said to do. And so when they did that, by faith, they would be healed from their uh, sin and, and their punishment. Well, I had never put that story and John chapter 3, red letters, John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 together. I had never put those two together. But look again at what Jesus says. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, Jesus said prophetically, so shall the Son of Man. Who's he talking about? He's talking about himself. So shall the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him would have eternal life. What's going to happen later in Jesus' life? He's going to be crucified on an old rugged cross. He's going to shed his blood. Why? For our sin. And what's going to be the result of it? If we look to the cross and we gaze upon Jesus who died for our sin. And we understand that that should be us on the cross. That should be me dying for my sin, my shortcomings, my failures, my rebellion. Uh, that should be me up on that cross, not God's only begotten son. And uh, so if we gaze upon the cross and we see our sin, um and we believe and we trust in what Jesus Christ did for us when he died on the cross and he was buried and he rose again. Uh, the Bible says if we confess with our mouths Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. And so we must also look to the cross. 2 Corinthians 5, I believe it's verse 21, says that he who knew no sin became sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God, the great transfer of all time, the great exchange of all time is Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins, taking on our sins. And then as a result of his faithful obedience to God to die on the cross for our sins, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, why? For our sinfulness, then we receive in exchange his 
total righteousness. And we become right with God as a result of his act of obedience. Our disobedience, punished on a cross by God's own dear son, and then we receive forgiveness and grace and mercy in everything that we don't deserve. But we, we receive it when we receive by faith the gift that God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ. But you must place your faith and your trust in him. Just like the Israelites had to look upon the bronze snake mounted on a pole, you have to look at the, the crucified Jesus on the cross and realize that that is your sin and that he died for you because he loved you and his grace is uh, a gift to you if you will but open your heart in faith and trust him to be your Savior and your Lord and your God. And so uh, that's what Jesus says. Uh, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. You know, there's a lot of craziness in this world today. And I don't know how much longer we have. I know they've been saying that from, you know, a long, long time. And so I may just be uh, just another one in the choir of voices. But I tell you, man, it just seems like uh, we could be on the, the cusp of the end times. And, and, uh, and, and I just have to ask you right here and right now, are you ready? Are you ready for Christ's return? And uh, I just want to beg you. Uh, that if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal God and Savior, uh, you can, by faith, uh, accept him into your heart and your life, and you can trust him and and realize that everything he did for you on the cross, it was for you. And uh, if you'll just believe, if you'll believe, then uh, he will save you, and you can have eternal life. I don't know what's going to happen in the near future with the world and everything in it. But I do that know that my, my hope is secure and my eternity is uh, already fixed because I've placed my faith and trust in Christ Jesus. And, and I pray that you'll do the same. So we get to the greatest verse in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world. In this way, uh, the Holman uh, translation says that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. And so we see that the Spirit of God, new birth, spiritual rebirth, being born again. You must be born again, Jesus told Nicodemus. It's a prerequisite. If you're going to see the kingdom of God, if you're going to go to heaven, you must be born again. We see that it's a work of the Spirit, the Spirit of God working in a person's heart and life. Um, And then we see that spiritual rebirth or new birth or being born again uh, comes when you have faith in Jesus Christ. You have to believe in God's Son and and what Jesus did for you on the cross. Uh, You must place your faith in Him and fully in Him, not in yourself. Don't trust in you. You have nothing to bring to the table Uh, Isaiah says that our righteousness is as filthy rags before a holy God. I have nothing. I'm bankrupt. I'm empty. I bring nothing to the table. My only hope is in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for me. And so I hope that you can say that as well. But, uh, But the third part, spirit's work, faith in Christ, But then we see that it is a gift from God. For God so loved the world. Why did he do this? Because he loved you and because he loved me. Uh, God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Man, thank you, Lord Jesus. Verse 17 and 18, I always say these are some of the most obscure verses in all of God's word. Why? Because John 3, 16 is so good that we typically just stop right there. Uh, But look at verses 17 and 18. They are awesome verses and they teach us so much. 
Listen to this. For God did not send his son into the world that he might condemn the world. That's not why God sent Jesus. God didn't send Jesus to condemn the world. Now, yes, God is holy. And yes, Jesus was, he lived a perfect life. But God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world. But why? So that the world could be saved through him. He sent Jesus to save, not to condemn, but to save. Did Jesus have the right to condemn? Absolutely, because we're all sinners and we all deserve death and we're uh, born under the curse. And we're born with a sinful nature and we're going to sin and we do sin and we are sinners and we deserve to die and we're guilty and we are under condemnation. But Jesus wasn't sent by God to the world to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. God sent Jesus, his son, why? To save. He sent his son to save. And then verse 18 teaches us so much. Anyone who believes in him, anyone who believes in him, who in Christ, is not condemned. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned. I don't want you to miss this. This is so vitally important for you to understand. Anyone who believes in Christ, you're not condemned. If you believe, you're not condemned. But if you don't believe in Christ, listen, you're already condemned because you have not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. I, I challenge you, look at verse 18. <clears throat> if you believe, no condemnation. But if you don't believe in Christ Jesus, you're already condemned. You say already, yeah. From the fall of uh, Adam and Eve, we've all been born under the curse. And we're born with a sinful nature. And the Bible teaches us that we're all going to sin. And because of our sin, we deserve to die. We're guilty of sin. And we're deserving of death and eternal damnation. Uh, we're condemned already. We're already condemned. That's why the Bible teaches us that we have to be adopted into the family of God. You're not born into the family of God. You're not born right with God. You're born with a sinful nature that's going to sin, that does sin, that deserves death, that is condemned, you're already condemned. And so you have to be born into the family of God. You have to be born again. You have to be adopted by faith. Uh, you have to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You have to be saved from being lost. Um, and so all this comes together right here in verse 18. Until you believe, you're condemned. But if you believe, you're no longer condemned. Romans 8, chapter 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're in Christ Jesus, you're no longer condemned. That means you are set free, you're forgiven, you've been given the promise of eternal life, you have Jesus living inside of you by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit and, uh, and your life is changed and you have victory and you have joy and you have peace and patience. Now, it doesn't mean that life isn't hard and that there aren't struggles in this life. Uh, we all go through struggles, but inwardly, we have a hope and a joy that nothing in this world can take away from us. Uh, Jesus said, don't fear the one that can destroy um, just your body, but fear the one who can destroy both your body and your spirit in hell. And so uh, we, we don't have to, what can man do to us? Uh, if God is for us, who can be against us? And, uh, and I tell you, if you're a son or a daughter of King Jesus, uh, then God is for you and, uh, and the victory is yours. And, uh, and we indeed have hope. So you believe you're not condemned. 
But if you don't believe, you're condemned already. And, uh, and your condemnation is going to be eternal separation from God in a place called hell. And rightfully so, uh, as you experience the wrath of God for all eternity. Why? Because you did not believe, because you rejected the gift of God's own Son. His grace to you was made possible through the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ, and if you'll just place your faith and trust in him, you will no longer be condemned. And so uh, that's the message that we have to get out to people, especially those of us who have experienced this grace and this mercy and forgiveness. We have to get the message out that you don't have to be condemned in your sin for all eternity, but you can turn to Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sin and for grace and mercy and salvation uh, in him. Now, let's wrap up. Uh, let me show you something that I thought was awesome. In John chapter 3, the verse uh, verses 1 and 2, we see Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night, uh, perhaps drawn by the Spirit of God, but we don't ever see what happens to Nicodemus. Uh, the last thing we see is in verse 9, where he says, how can these things be? And so it just doesn't appear that he gets it. And he's not understanding. And Jesus is trying to help him understand, but uh, the last thing we see is that he just doesn't get it. Now, um, I was reminded this week of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, where Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but it was God who caused the increase. And I was reminded of the threefold process of evangelism. There are those who plant the seeds of evangelism in people's hearts. God uses you, something you say, something you do, an act of kindness, uh, a witness for Jesus Christ, uh, a stand, a conviction that you, you make known, um, the word of God that you share with someone, a witness. You, you try to witness to someone. And God takes that, and that, those are seeds that are planted. And then Paul says, Apollos watered. And so you don't know it, but in your life, as you live Jesus before other people, and you share uh, the word of God with other people, and you are a verbal witness to people, sometimes uh, in your prayers, certainly, your, your faithful prayers for people and their salvation— all of that God uses to water those seeds that were planted in a person's heart and life. And then occasionally, you get to be a part of the harvest, or you get to see the harvest. You get to see someone come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And what an awesome, awesome blessing that is uh, when we see people come to know Jesus Christ and their lives are forever changed uh, and, and there's just that process of evangelism. Well, in John chapter 3, we don't see any evidence that Nicodemus becomes a believer. And so we could say that we do see Jesus sharing the truth or the truths of God with Nicodemus. So this could be uh, very well uh, the planting of seeds. Um, maybe uh, Jesus is sharing this truth, and it, it's it's the seed planting part of the process of evangelism in Nicodemus's life. Now, if you'll turn over to John chapter nineteen, John chapter nineteen, and uh, right after Jesus's death on the cross, his crucifixion. Right afterwards, in John chapter 19, verse 38, it says that Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because of his fear of the Jews. So if you'll remember Mark and Luke and Matthew, I can't remember uh, who all said what, but um, Joseph was a rich man. And it's going to be Joseph's grave that Jesus' body is placed in. The stone's going to be rolled in front of the grave. And, and then on the third day, the, roll, the stone's going to be rolled away. And Jesus is going to 
come back uh, to life and and be raised from the dead. So this is Joseph of Arimathea. John says uh, that he is a secret disciple of Jesus. Uh, that is, he he's following Jesus, but just secretly because of the fear of the Jews. Now think about it. Jesus is being crucified at this moment. And, um, and anybody associated with Jesus would have probably been possibly crucified as well. And so Joseph is a secret disciple of Jesus, is what John tells us. He goes to Pilate, and isn't this interesting that it's all in fulfillment of Scripture? I mean, um, Joseph didn't probably know that he was fulfilling Scripture, but a rich man, remember uh, the prophecy said Jesus' body, the Messiah's body, would be buried with the rich. And so Joseph is a rich man, He's asking Pilate for the body of Jesus so that he could give him a proper burial. And he comes to take the body away. But look in verse 39. Nicodemus also came, bringing a mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. And it says in parentheses in my Bible, John records for us, this is the Nicodemus who had previously come to Jesus at night. And so here's Joseph of Arimathea fulfilling Scripture, probably not knowing it, but fulfilling Scripture, being used of God to fulfill the Scripture, the prophecy, that he would take Jesus' body as a secret disciple of Jesus and give him a proper burial. And notice who is with Joseph, Nicodemus, who had previously come to Jesus at night, what is he doing? He's bringing the pounds of the myrrh and the aloes. They take Jesus's body, they wrap it in linen cloths with the aromatic uh, spices according to the burial custom of the Jews, and they place his body in the tomb nearby. I don't know what to say except for it is a high probability that Nicodemus is also a secret disciple of Jesus with Joseph because he is with Joseph as they wrap up and put the spices on the dead body of Jesus Christ and they give him the proper burial. Um, and, you know, could it be that those seeds planted by Jesus back in John chapter 3 are now, we see, made evident in John chapter 19 with Nicodemus being there at the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus Christ. You know, we may never know until we get to heaven, but uh, there are many who believe that Nicodemus is probably going to be there waiting on us, which is awesome. Um, and I hope and pray that you will join uh, me and uh, make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior and uh, look forward to the day when you will enter heaven's gates and get to spend all eternity with him, not because you deserved it, but because God in his great love gave his only begotten son. And the work of the Spirit was drawing you to himself. And at the time that he revealed this to you, that big word, the act of regeneration, you in turn placed your faith and your trust in the only one who can save you. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but through me. And uh, Acts chapter 4 uh, I believe verse 12, there's no other name given to men whereby they must be saved except for the name of Jesus Christ. And so call on his name and uh, and be saved. That's all I can say. And then uh, for the rest of us, hey, that is our job, is to get the word out so that people don't have to be condemned, but that they can be saved. For that is the very reason that God sent his one and only son. Let's pray. 
God, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for the greatest gift of all, the gift of your Son. And thank you that by faith, we can respond to the work of the Spirit as he's revealing the truth of uh, salvation to men and women, boys and girls, all over the globe. And uh, Father, thank you that your word says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. And we pray that many, many people will come to that saving knowledge so that they don't have to live uh, eternally separated from you and, uh, and, and stay condemned apart from you. Father, uh, bless our service now. Be with Brother Bard as he shares with us the word of God. Speak to our hearts and continue to uh, make us more like your son Jesus every day. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.